book two chapters ten through twelve of the consoling thoughts of saint francis de sales by jean joseph Huguet. this librivox recording is in the public domain book two consoling thoughts on trials of an interior life infirmities of soul and body chapter ten advantages which we ought to draw from our defects the matter on which i am about to treat is one of the most important of a spiritual life it is certain that in the views of god the faults into which he permits us to fall should serve for our sanctification and that it depends on ourselves to draw this advantage from them what i have to say on this subject does not concern those cowardly and selfish souls who make reservations with god and who wish only to belong to him to a certain degree they commit with foresight and reflection a thousand faults from which it is impossible they should derive any advantage considering their evil dispositions the persons for whom i write are those only who are determined not to commit any fault deliberately though many escape them through surprise inadvertence and weakness notwithstanding their resolution it usually happens that such persons are astonished and troubled at their faults conceive a false shame for them and fall into vexation and discouragement these are the effects of self-love and are much more pernicious than the faults themselves we are surprised at falling an evident mark that we scarcely know ourselves we ought on the contrary to be surprised at not falling more frequently and into more grievous faults and return thanks to god for the dangers from which he preserves us we are troubled every time that we are beguiled into some fault lose interior peace are agitated and spend hours even days thinking of it we should never be troubled but when we find ourselves on the ground arise tranquillity return to god with love ask his forgiveness and reflect no more on what has occurred unless when it is necessary to accuse ourselves of it we have a false shame for our faults we can hardly venture to discover them to our confessor what idea will he have of me after so many promises so many assurances i have given him if you declare your faults simply and humbly he will have more esteem for you if you have a difficulty in telling them to him his confidence in you will diminish on account of your want of sincerity but the worst of all is that we are vexed at being vexed and impatient at being impatient what a misery should we not see that this is pride that we are humbled on finding ourselves less holy than we had imagined that we aspire to be exempt from imperfections and faults only in order to applaud and congratulate ourselves on having spent one day a week without much matter of reproach in fine we are discouraged we abandon our exercises one by one we give up prayer we regard perfection as impossible and despair of arriving at any such height what will this constraint we say this continual watching over oneself this struggle after recollection and mortification avail us since we correct nothing fall incessantly and never become better there is not a craftier snare of the demon than this would you wish to be protected from it never be discouraged and no matter what fault you happen to commit say though i should fall twenty times or a hundred times a day i will arise at every fall and pursue my course what does it amount to after all that you should have met with some accidents on the way provided you safely reach the journey's end god will not reproach you after your recovery 
very often those mishaps proceed from the rapidity of our speed and from that ardor which prevents us from taking the necessary precautions timid and cautious souls who always wish to see where they put their foot who turn aside every moment for fear of making a false step who cannot bear to have their shoes soiled never advance so quickly as others who are less punctilious but more daring and whom death often overtakes in the midst of their course it is not those who commit the least number of faults that are the most holy but those who have the greatest courage the greatest generosity the greatest love who make the boldest efforts to overcome themselves and are not immoderately apprehensive of tripping or even of falling and being dirtied a little provided they advance st paul has told us that everything turns to good for those who love god everything turns to their welfare even their faults and sometimes the most grievous faults god permits those faults in order to heal a vain presumption and to teach us what we are and of what we are capable david acknowledged that the adultery and homicide into which he had fallen served to keep him in continual distrust of himself it is a blessing for me he says to god that thou hast humbled me i have been more faithful since to thy commandments the fall of st peter was a most useful lesson to him and the humility with which it inspired him disposed him to receive the gifts of the holy spirit and to become head of the church and preserved him amid the dangers of so eminent a position st paul during the period of his greatest success in the apostleship preserved himself against pride and vanity by remembering that he had been a blasphemer and a persecutor of the church of god a humiliating temptation from which god would not deliver him served as a counterpoise to the sublimity of his revelations if god knows how to draw advantage even from the greatest sins who can suppose that he will fail to turn our daily faults to our sanctification it is a remark made by the masters of a spiritual life that very often god leaves in the holiest souls some defects which notwithstanding all their endeavors they cannot eradicate he acts thus in order to make them feel their weakness to show them what they would be without grace to guard them from the inflation of vanity on account of his favors to dispose them to receive other benefits with greater humility to keep a holy self-hatred alive in their breasts to withdraw them from the snares of self-love to preserve their fervor and confidence towards him and to teach them the necessity of having continual recourse to prayer the child that tumbles when it wanders a little distance from its mother returns to her with greater tenderness and from experience learns not to quit her in a hurry again the lesson it has received on its own weakness and its mother's goodness inspires it with a livelier affection for her the faults into which we fall often give place to great acts of virtue which otherwise we should never have had occasion to practice and god permits our faults for this end for example a dash of temper a brusque reply a manifest impatience just fits one for a good act of humility which abundantly repairs the fault and the scandal it had given the fault is committed by a sudden impulse the reparation is made with reflection by a victory over one's self and with a full and deliberate will the latter is an act much more agreeable to god than the former as a fault was disagreeable to him god makes use of our faults and apparent imperfections to conceal our sanctity from the eyes of others and to procure us 
humiliations from them god is a great master let us allow him to act he will not fail at his work let us propose to ourselves to avoid carefully the least thing in the world that could displease him but when we shall have fallen into some faults let us be sorry on his account not on our own let us cherish the abjection arising from our mishaps and constantly beg of god to draw from them his own glory and our humiliation he will do so and advance us a great deal further by this means than by a life more regular and holy in appearance but not so efficacious for the destruction of self-love when god requires certain things from us let us not retire under pretext of the faults we should commit in performing them it is much better to do good with imperfection than to omit it sometimes we do not give a correction that is necessary through fear of being carried away by impatience we avoid the conversation of certain persons whose faults offend and annoy us but how shall we acquire virtues if we fly their occasions is not this a greater fault than that into which we fear to fall let us have a good intention attend where duty calls and be satisfied that god is sufficiently indulgent to pardon us the faults into which his service and our desire of pleasing him expose us chapter eleven trials in prayer prayer illumines our understanding with a divine light and lays open our will to the holy flames of celestial love nothing so much purifies our mind from its errors or our will from its depraved affections it is a water of benediction which makes the plants of our good desires grow green again and flourish satiates the thirst of our hearts and allays the heat of irregular concupiscence that uneasiness you experience at prayer and which is joined with a great anxiety to discover some object capable of arresting and contenting your mind is alone sufficient to prevent you from finding what you seek when we search for anything with too much eagerness we pass it by a hundred times without perceiving it the result of this vain and useless anxiety is weariness of mind hence coldness and torpor of soul i know not what remedies you should use but if you can possibly prevent this solicitude you will do a good work devotion cannot meet a more pestiferous enemy it takes the semblance of endeavouring to excite us towards virtue but only in order to cool us and makes us run but to overthrow us we must then guard against excessive ardour on all occasions but particularly in prayer to assist you in this you should remember that the graces and favours of prayer are not earthly but heavenly waters which all our efforts cannot acquire but for which indeed we must dispose ourselves with humble and tranquil care we must hold up our heart open to heaven and await the sacred dew and never forget to carry this consideration to prayer that therein we approach to god and do so for two principal reasons the first is to render to god the honour and homage which we owe him and this can be done without his speaking to us or our speaking to him acknowledging by our presence that he is our god and we his vile creatures and remaining prostrate in spirit before him awaiting his commands how many courtiers are there who appear a hundred times before the king not to speak to him or hear him but simply to be seen by him and to testify by their assiduity that they are his servants this motive of presenting ourselves before god merely to attest our engagement in his service is most pure worthy 
and excellent and consequently of the highest perfection the second reason for which we come before god is to speak to him and to hear him speak to us by his inspirations and interior motions and this is usually performed with a delicious pleasure because it is a great happiness to speak to so mighty a lord and when he answers he is accustomed to pour out such precious balm and unction as fill the soul to overflowing with sweetness one of these reasons may sometimes fail us but both never if we can speak to our lord let us speak to him praise him beseech him listen to him if we cannot because we are hoarse let us remain in his chamber and pay him reverence he will observe us there regard our patience and be pleased with our silence another time we shall be amazed when he takes us by the hand and shows us every thing making a hundred turns along the beautiful walks of the garden of prayer but even if he should never do so we ought to be content with fulfilling our duty of accompanying his suite and consider that it is already too great an honor for him to endure us in his presence put aside those heart-rending inquietudes and no longer say that you can do nothing in prayer what would you wish to do there but what you really do which is to represent and offer to god your misery and nothingness the most beautiful address that beggars make is to expose to our eyes their sores and their rags but sometimes you will tell me you cannot even do so much as this for you remain there as a shadow or a statue very well that is just as good in the palaces of kings there are statues arranged which serve only to recreate the royal vision be content then as one of these in the presence of god he will animate this statue when he pleases you ask me how you should act in order to carry your soul straight to god without looking to the right hand or to the left the question is so much the more agreeable to me as it carries its answer along with it you must do what you say go straight to god without looking to the right hand or to the left this is not what you ask i see but how you should act in order so to establish your soul on god that nothing may be able to detach it from him two things are necessary for that namely to die and to be saved no more separation then but your soul will be indissolubly attached and united to its god you say that this is not yet what you ask but how you should act in order to prevent the least trifle from withdrawing your soul from god as only too often happens you mean to say i suppose the least distraction well you ought to know that the least trifle of a distraction cannot withdraw your soul from god since nothing withdraws us from god but sin and the resolutions we make in the morning to keep our soul united to god and attentive to his presence has the effect of preserving us thus always even when we sleep since we do all in the name of god and according to his most holy will even venial sins are not capable of turning us aside from the way which conducts to god they undoubtedly retard us a little on our course but they do not turn us aside much less simple distractions so far as prayer is concerned it is not less useful or less agreeable to god when accompanied with many distractions on the contrary it may be more useful than if we had many consolations because it is more laborious provided however that we have the wish to withdraw from those distractions and do not allow our mind to dwell on them willingly the very same observation applies to the difficulty which during the day we feel to fix our mind on god 
and on heavenly things provided we endeavor to keep our thoughts from running after trifles and learn patience by not growing weary of our labor which is suffered for the love of god we must distinguish between god and the perception of god between faith and the feeling of faith a person about to suffer martyrdom for god does not always think of god at that time and though he has no feeling of faith yet he does not cease to merit or to perform an act of the greatest love it is the same with the presence of god we must content ourselves with considering that he is our god and we are his weak creatures unworthy of that honour thus st francis spent a whole night saying to god who art thou o lord and who am i he who in praying to god perceives that he prays is not perfectly attentive to prayer for he turns away his attention from god to think on the prayer which he offers even the care that we have not to have distractions is often a very great distraction simplicity in spiritual actions is their most commendable quality would you wish to behold god behold him then and be attentive to that for if you begin to reflect and to examine how you look yourself while you are looking on him it is no longer god you are viewing but yourself he who is occupied in fervent prayer pays no attention as to whether he is engaged in prayer or not for he thinks not of the prayer which he makes but of god to whom he makes it he who burns with the ardour of sacred love does not recall his heart to consider what it does but keeps it fixed on god employed in loving him and whose love it is consumed the heavenly chorister takes so much pleasure in pleasing his god that he finds no pleasure in the melody of his voice unless because it pleases his god chapter twelve consolation in temptation be not troubled however great the temptations that assail you let the enemy rage at the door let him stamp thump romp yell do the worst in his power we are sure he cannot enter but by the door of our consent let us keep it closed often taking a look to see that it is properly fastened and there is nothing to fear humble yourself very much and be not at all surprised the lilies that grow among thorns are the whitest what does he know who has not been tempted it is a misfortune that you dread temptation so much be assured that all the temptations of hell cannot sully a soul which is displeased with them let them do their worst then the apostle st paul suffered terrible ones and god out of love for him would not remove them come come have courage let this heart belong to jesus and let the mastiff bark at the door as long as he pleases join the sweet jesus and his sweet mother in the midst of darkness nails thorns lances derelictions live for a time in tears without obtaining anything god will at length rejoice you and grant you the desire of your heart but even if he should not let us not cease to serve him for he does not cease to be our god and the affection that we owe to him should be immortal and imperishable i observe very distinctly the ant-hill of inclinations that self-love nourishes and spreads over your heart and i know quite well that the nature of your subtle delicate and fertile mind contributes something thereto but still they are only inclinations and since you are annoyed by their importunity there is no reason to suppose that they are accepted by any consent or at least by any deliberate consent no your dear soul having conceived the great desire with which god has inspired it to belong to him 
could not easily consent to any contrary design your heart may be shaken by its passions but i think it can rarely sin by consent miserable man that i am said the great apostle who will deliver me from this body of death he perceives a regular army composed of his humours and aversions natural habits and earthly inclinations that have determined on his spiritual death and because he fears them he testifies that he hates them and because he hates them he cannot endure them without grief and his grief finds expression in this affecting exclamation to which he replies himself by saying that the grace of god through jesus christ should preserve him not from fear or from terror or from alarm or from battle but from defeat it is true you say but i have already often taken the knife to cut off and circumcise my passions i have done all as appears to me that i possibly could employing much time with very great care and vigilance yet i still experience the same aversions disgusts and repugnances oh my dear soul do you not know that we are not in this world for enjoyment but for suffering wait a while until you are in heaven and then you will possess a full peace and a perfect contentment exempt from all the irregular motions of a nature vitiated and corrupted by sin a tranquillity and repose unalterable because it is there we are to enjoy peace and not in this life where we must suffer and must circumcise ourselves he who would live here without passions would not suffer but enjoy himself which cannot be for as long as we live we shall have passions and shall never be free from them before death according to the opinion of doctors received by the church but why be in trouble since in combating those passions and motions lies our victory our triumph our glory to be in this world and not to feel any emotion of passion is an inconsistency the glorious saint bernard says that it is heresy to assert that we can persevere in one same state here below inasmuch as the holy ghost speaking by the mouth of job concerning man declares that he never remains in the same state this is an answer to your complaints regarding the levity and inconsistency of your soul for i believe without a doubt that it is continually beaten about by the winds of its passions and consequently is always in commotion but i believe as firmly that the grace of god and your good resolutions remain steady in the summit of your soul where the standard of the cross is firmly planted and where faith hope and charity exclaim aloud live jesus take notice of this so long as the temptation displeases you there is nothing to fear for why does it displease you but because you do not approve of it these importune temptations come from the malice of the devil but the pain we feel on their account comes from the mercy of god who in opposition to the will and from the wickedness of our enemy draws a holy tribulation by which he refines the gold intended for his treasury i say then that your temptations are from the devil and hell but your afflictions are from god and heaven the mothers are from babylon but the daughters are from jerusalem despite the vain allurements embrace the precious tribulation it is necessary for the soldier to be victorious in war to be at his ease in peace never shall we possess perfect meekness and charity unless we are exercised in repugnances aversions and disgusts true peace does not consist in never fighting but is found after the victory the vanquished no longer combat yet they do not enjoy true peace 
we should be exceedingly humble to see that we are yet so little masters of ourselves and so much attached to our own ease and repose we shall obtain no recompense without victory no victory without war have courage then and by converting your pain which is without remedy into merit make a virtue of necessity look often to our lord who regards you poor little creature as you are amid your labors and distractions he will send you aid and will bless your afflictions you should on this consideration take patiently and quietly the tediousness that grieves you and bear it meekly for the love of him who only permits it for your good elevate then your heart frequently to god beg his assistance and let your chief consolation be the happiness of belonging to him every object of displeasure will be of little account when you remember that you have so kind a friend so great a support so excellent a refuge end of book two chapter twelve